A lot of this isn't going to make sense to you, and I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to start at the beginning with the house. I lived here until I was 11, but I wasn't allowed inside half the rooms. I hadn't been back since my brother Lewis's funeral. In her will, my mother left me a key, but didn't tell me what I'd unlocked. Maybe she thought I'd know. Or she thought that the mystery would be enough to bring me back. No one had driven this way in a long time, but I saw a few hoof prints. The truth is, even after I inherited the house, I never thought I'd come back to it. But now I had questions about my family that only the house knew the answers to. The house was exactly like I remembered it, the way I'd been dreaming about it. As a child, the house made me uncomfortable in a way I couldn't put into words. Now, as a 17-year-old, I knew exactly what those words were. I was afraid of the house. I hoped the key might unlock the front door. It didn't. Looking in, I felt like the house itself had been waiting for me.
Crawling through the doggy door used to be a lot easier when I was 11. had been turned off the night we left. For the first time in years, I felt like I was home. But instead of a family, there were just memories of one. Like how after Lewis started working at the cannery, we all got sick of eating salmon. Except our cat, Molly. Or how only one restaurant would deliver to our house. So we had Chinese a lot. The table was still a wreck from the night we left. It was like a bomb had gone off, killing everyone but sparing the furniture. My mom was the only one of us who could imagine Great Grandma Edie living in a nursing home. Nothing in the house looked abnormal. There was just too much of it, like a smile with too many teeth. Even the fireplace had a story. Edie told me the bricks came from the original house after it sank. Great Grandpa Sven built a music box for Barbara, along with the rest of the house. My mom wasn't much of an optimist, but she never stopped believing that my brother Milton was alive. A lot of things got left behind in the whirlwind of that last night. Mom always told me to stay out of the basement, so I wasn't too surprised when the key didn't fit. After Milton disappeared, Mom sealed up all the bedrooms. Then Edie retaliated and drilled peepholes. I spent a lot of time playing in Great Uncle Walter's room. I think my mom sometimes regretted not sealing it up. Lewis told me there were secret passages, but I never believed him. It's 
Turns out, my mom was really good at keeping secrets. Now it was time to find out what my mom had been afraid of. From the paintings on the wall, it was clear my brother Milton had been here before me. Reading this, maybe it sounds like I had a plan. But I had no idea what was behind that door. Just like I had no idea where all this was gonna lead. I grew up looking at Molly's room through the peephole. Being inside for the first time, I felt like I'd stepped behind a painting. December 13th, 1947. Dear Diary, I'll be gone soon, but I wanted to tell somebody about what's going to happen. It started when Mom sent me to bed without dinner. I woke up and I was starving, so I looked around for something to eat. The gerbil food was dry, but I didn't mind it. My Halloween candy was all gone. I thought about eating Christopher, but I held back. things that night. Then I heard chirping outside my window. It was a barn swallow going back to her nest. I reached out for her. Suddenly, I was a cat. I tried to be quiet, but the bird was really scared. didn't even look at me.
got her. I could tell she was getting really tired. Now I was up in the big tree. I promised Dad I wouldn't climb it anymore. All I cared about was eating that mama bird. I gobbled her up. And suddenly, I was an owl. First, all I heard was the wind. Then I heard little teeth nibbling in the grass. cliff and into the ocean. Now, I was hungrier than ever. I wanted fat, juicy seals. I tore off her flipper and it tasted really good. Everything had changed. Now I was a monster. And I smelled people up there. I was big, but I moved real quiet. Stop, but 
also, I did it. onto the sand, and the good smell went into an old pipe. Closer and closer. All my stomach started growling. And suddenly, I was me again. I held my breath for a long time, but I couldn't hear anything. I'm not sure if I believed all of that, but I'm sure Edie would have. This will be obvious later, but my mom never told me any of these stories. Edie would have, but mom didn't like bringing up the past. Though, when we adopted a stray kitten, she was the one who named it Molly. I spent a lot of time in Great Grandma Edie's room. Louis died a week before we left. But Edie had already started to memorialize him. Edie knit me a new pair of gloves every year, just in time to replace the old ones. Her room was like a museum. Edie gave a big interview about a mole man living under the Finch house. My mom was furious. I hadn't thought of myself as Edith Jr. for a long, long time. When Edie told people Sven was killed by a dragon, she could also have said he was building a dragon-shaped slide that collapsed. She could have, but she didn't. Even in her 90s, sometimes Edie seemed a lot younger than my mother. The only trace Grandpa Sam's first wife Kay left on the house was the pink bathroom.
It was a pretty big trace. There's a secret in this bathroom. It's in the last place you would look. It isn't in the cupboard. It's hidden in this book. Sven gave Sam an old camera he'd refurbished. He never put it down. For 500 years, the Finches have been famous throughout Norway for their fortune and misfortune. Odin Finch buries the latest victims of the family curse, his wife Ingeborg and their newborn son, Johan. On January 7th, 1937, he set sail with his family and his house, hoping to leave the curse behind. But 40-foot waves off the coast of Washington send the house and Odin to the bottom of the sea. Odin's daughter Edie, with husband Sven and baby Molly, step ashore on their new home, Orcas Island. Odin Finch is the first to be buried in the new family cemetery. His daughter Edie is already dreaming of a new Finch house. Whatever's wrong with this family, it goes back a long ways. Grandpa Sam had a twin, and that he never talked about him. I guess my grandpa didn't like history any more than my mom did. How I want to remember my brother by Sam Finch. The thing I remember is that when he made up his mind, that was it. My 
My brother said he'd die before he ate another mushroom. And he did. At Barbara's funeral, we swore he'd never be afraid again. And he wasn't. I think Calvin always wanted to fly. But that day, he finally made up his mind to do it. I told him going around was impossible. Maybe if I hadn't said that. Maybe if the wind hadn't picked up. Then maybe he'd still be here. But I doubt. I think he'd already made up his mind. That's what I want to remember about my brother. The day he made up his mind to fly, and he did. Calvin's story felt strangely familiar. When I was younger, I remember trying to do the exact same thing. After the funeral, Edie roped off Calvin's half of the room. Mom said Grandpa Sam enlisted at 18 and never set foot in the room again. Passages were a pretty tight fit. They'd obviously been built for smaller hands and bellies. Growing up, I always thought of Barbara as a child star. I never thought about how hard it must have been for her afterwards.
Of all the stories people wrote about Barbara's death, I'm surprised Edie saved this one. Old Jack here with another ghastly tale inspired by America's most unfortunate family. I'm calling it The Surprise Ending of Barbara Finch. As a child star, Barbara was famous for her scream. Now at 16, she was all washed up has been. But in a lucky break, she'd been asked to perform her signature scream at a local convention for monster movie fans. It was just a boost her career needed. Unfortunately, her scream hadn't aged well. <coughs> mm, getting better. I think you just need the right motivation. Her biggest fan and current boyfriend, Rick, was about to demonstrate when... Now that was a great scream. It was Barbara's father, Sven. He'd slipped into a table saw and had to be rushed to the emergency room. So Barbara got stuck babysitting her youngest brother, Walter. Her convention comeback was cancelled. Okay, I'm hearing frustration, but I'm not hearing terror. What if I tried... A gang of hoodlums and Halloween masks have been terrorizing Orca's Island tonight. Police are urging residents to... That came from the basement. You're right. Also, I loved your delivery on that. Why is your basement door locked? Because my dad likes making puzzles and secret passages. There's a key hidden in the music box. The secret is to keep winding and winding until finally the key pops out. Thanks, babe. I'll be back in a sec. Twenty minutes later, Rick hadn't returned. So Barbara went to look for him right on cue. She reached for the music. She wound the key. She listened to Rick, but the house was silent. She found Rick's crutch and imagined the worst. Dr. Carl Hamill, who impaled and then ate his family ten years ago tonight. just trying to scare you to help you find your scream. Well, I'm not scared, Rick. I'm furious. Then act furious. All I'm getting from you now is that you're hurt and confused and... She threw him out, but she kept a little something to remember him by. Barb, have you seen my other crutch? And she was still holding it when she fell asleep watching the late, late picture show. Hours later... Barbara! Walter, what's going on up there? Ah! Okay, I'm coming up. But if this is a trick, you're dead, Walter.
Orcas Island police describe the man as six feet tall with a steel hook for a hand. Residents are urged to lock all doors and windows and notify the police of any suspicious activity. I returned, saw the hook man, and was speechless. He was quite smashing. <laughs> There's got to be another way out of here. That night, she played her part beautifully. monsters they were, and she realized what was about to happen. She was going to be famous. And with her final breath, Barbara Finch gave the performance of her life. I wasn't there myself, but I hear Barbara was magnificent. Poor girl. She had a taste for stardom. But unfortunately, so did her fans. Of course, the police blamed it all on poor Rick, who disappeared the same night. And little Walter? Hiding under his bed the whole time. He took it all pretty hard. But that's another story. As for Barbara, tucked inside the music box is all they ever found of her. Her ear. Now that's what I call a real eerie tale. Edie told me all Barbara wanted was to be remembered, as absurd as that comic was. Maybe what Edie saw was a happy ending.
I guess now I know why mom didn't like me playing with the music box. Edie's father, Odin, built the original house. Whenever people ask me about my family, the first thing they always want to know about is Barbara. Funny, all those times I played with the music box and never found the basement key. Mom said the basement was off limits, unless I wanted another tetanus shot. I saw Edie sneak down to the basement once, carrying packages. Thought maybe she was hiding presents. It turned out she was hiding a lot more than that. I remember asking mom once about where Walter had gone. She said after Barbara died, he got as far away as he could. If there's a pattern in all these stories, I think it's that none of us has gotten very far. Goodbye, everyone. I can't believe I've been down here for 30 years. On that first day, after the shaking started, I didn't think I'd survive the week. But after a few days, I settled into a routine. That's what kept me sane. Having a schedule, living for today. I always expected to be dead tomorrow. But if you wait long enough, you'll be used to anything. Even a monster on the other side of the door starts to feel normal. Almost friendly. And then one day, everything just stopped. Whatever that thing was, it was gone. Maybe it got tired of waiting. 
Or maybe I just got tired of being afraid. It's been a week now, the longest in 30 years. I'm done waiting. I have to leave while I still can. It's out there, somewhere. Whatever killed Barbara. And Molly. And Calvin. Maybe this is all a mistake. But I need to stop living the same day, even if it kills me. Whatever's out there, I want you to know I'm ready for it. I'm going to appreciate all of it, especially the food. I don't mind if I only have a year left. Or a month. Or a single week. I'd be happy with one new day. I can already imagine the sun on my face. Walter died when I was six. I can't believe my mom never told me he was down here. I'm sure my mom was trying to protect me. <laughs> Maybe she was afraid I'd end up like Walter. But if she never told me about an uncle under the house, I can only imagine what else she was hiding. I don't want to make the same mistakes she made. Trying to bury something that's still alive. <sighs> now that there's only one of us left, or maybe two, I thought it was time I heard the stories for myself and found out what happened to everyone else. But now I'm worried the stories themselves might be the problem. Maybe we believed so much in a family curse, we made it real. I don't know if I should even be writing this. Maybe it'd be better if all this just died with me. But I 
thought you should know about your family. And the history you're a part of. Though to be honest, I feel as lost as you probably do right now. I think the people in these stories believed them, for what that's worth. Look at the house. Had that history of imagination and stubbornness and madness. Any of it seems possible. I think we've been surrounded by death for so long, we've just gotten used to it. What kind of family finishes building a cemetery before starting the house? It's embarrassing for me to admit this, but the pet cemetery may be more uncomfortable than the human one. Three of the gerbils are mine, and two had been my fault. <laughs> 